it also feels like as good a time as any to make a video about my weight loss journey, as I have now lost almost exactly half my body weight. I am literally half the man I used to be. And that's a really good soundbite. I might use this at the beginning of this video. Okay, recording. I can't reach. I've done this again. I've done this thing where I... So this is my weight loss video. The script for this video has taken me over two months of daily typing and editing to write. Recently, I asked for questions in a community post on my channel and on my Patreon. This subject is one I've procrastinated about for a while, for absolutely ages. I've been meaning to make this video for a long time and needed a hook to make it happen, which is why I asked you guys for some questions. Everything I discuss and cover in this video comes directly from questions I've been asked over the past couple of weeks on both Patreon and YouTube. This is me in 2018 and 2019 coming to the end of my 30s and about to turn 40. I weighed approximately 190 kgs or 30 stone. Let's do this. Can we jog? Oh. Keep it up. Ah, uh, oh, I'm dying. For anyone, including me sometimes, that can't picture just how big this is, the average man in his 40s in the UK is 13 stone. I had to Google that. I was 17 stone heavier than average Joe you may pass on the high street. So we're on a 10 mile hike today. <laughs> what? <laughs> What's that? I haven't got a camera voice. Now you're going to try and not do it. I'm not. Because you know you're... Well, give me, go on, give me something to say. Hi, my name's Ryan. Welcome to the mix. <laughs> the implications that this had on my health, both physical and mental, was huge. There was one tipping point, not the main one, when I realised that I'd allowed things to go too far. If feeling this bad wasn't bad enough, it was that most traditional bathroom scales didn't, and probably still don't, I haven't checked, go past 160 kg or 25 stone. I was too heavy to be able to weigh myself. Did you get me walking on? Forget being able to buy clothes off the peg in normal high street shops, that privilege I'd given up on years before. But I was also past the point that even bathroom scale manufacturers didn't bother with. I mean, if this wasn't Channel 5 documentary fat, then I don't know what is. Going to my GP just to get weighed wasn't a great way of doing things. I mean, anyone living in the UK will know how hard it is to get a doctor's appointment. Thank you to Tory party for that one. I then discovered and used the scales in my local pharmacy. I found them to be very accurate. Not only did they measure my weight, but they also had other stats such as my body fat percentage. This was important to me as I needed a starting point, something to measure and focus on. This is me now in 2024, weighing 95 kgs. Well, I'm actually now 94.6 kgs to be exact, based on a weigh-in I had two weeks ago. That's a 95 kg or 15 stone weight loss. I have lost two stone more than the average adult male in the UK. I've lost a whole person. It also feels like as good a time as any to make a video about my weight loss journey, as I have now lost almost exactly half my body weight. I am literally half the man I used to be. The thing that really blows my mind is how I moved around carrying all that weight. I recently route marched the Yorkshire Three Peaks, carrying a 45 pound or 20 kg backpack, and it was really, really bloody heavy. I lived and operated carrying almost five times that amount on my back, legs, arms, and stomach. But having gone through that transformation, having lived that journey and still somewhat being on it myself now, I'm still very much on that journey, I know that there is an audience for this sort of thing. Men and women wanting to make change like I did. <laughs> I can see the finish, Matt. I can see the finish and we're still running. Come on, there's the finish. All the videos I used to watch talked about how to run or cycle further using this tactic or try this training plan to get faster. Here we go. <laughs> but there was always a basic assumption by the video creator that I, as the viewer, had a basic level of fitness. 
Now, there were some exceptions to this in the form of really good videos about the Couch to 5K program. Now, Couch to 5K does have a walking version that you can start off and gradually build up to, but I couldn't even complete them. I would challenge anyone to put on a 100 kg weighted backpack and then attempt to run faster or further. I mean, I don't recommend anyone put on a 100 kg backpack at all. It's really heavy. Anyway, my point is, I don't know what I'm doing. Don't put 100 kg in a backpack and then try and run with it. Now, having said that, I probably should point out that I'm not a nutritionist, dietitian, or even a fitness expert. I always tell anyone interested in what I do, do not copy me. I'm not a fitness YouTuber, but I do make YouTube videos about my fitness journey. What I did and what I do now works for me. I wouldn't assume to tell anyone what to do or to copy me. But when I make these videos, I do hope to inspire people as I once wanted to be inspired. Now, the best piece of advice I can give to anyone wanting to make a change, lose weight or get fit, do what you know will work for you. Don't copy or emulate anyone, especially YouTubers or influencers who have a vested interest in clicks. Muscles don't necessarily mean fit and bright sparkly gym clothes don't necessarily mean capable or competent. I make videos on my YouTube channel to document my fitness journey. I started making videos about some of my first walks and challenges I undertook five years ago now as a way of keeping myself focused and on the challenge. Results and change always comes from willpower and belief. I'm hoping that wind isn't too strong. So in October I did the 30-30 challenge, which was 30 days of consecutive running, which means no breaks for 30 minutes every day. That was the challenge to keep starting my want to do the London Marathon. And I hoped I'd be able to look back at some of these videos happy with my progress. I mean, I do watch them occasionally, not very often. They are very, very cringy and I'm very awkward talking to camera, but they're there as a document of my journey. I'm now 1.3 miles into the walk. I'm walking from Canterbury to Y, which is exactly 10 miles. I had zero cardio ability. I couldn't physically move fast enough to call anything I did a run. So I walked everywhere first and pretty much didn't stop. I would first walk to the end of my road and then to the end of the next road, then to the park and then around the park. And eventually I could walk further for longer, taking advantage of local footpaths and trails I eventually fell in love with. And I still miss to this day because we moved about 18 months ago. I did this every single day for a year, every single day. My targets and ambitions are now more fitness related because they can be. I've moved away from being 100% focused on just my weight loss, even though I still have a long way to go to be in to be in the super light person I want to be, or the person I imagine I can be, five years ago, I couldn't set fitness ambitions as I physically couldn't achieve them. It was pointless and I knew it would end in disappointment. Can you hear that knocking? Someone hammering, one of my neighbors. Someone asked me why I do this. Funny enough, yesterday, genuinely asked me why the hell I was doing this. And it's a good question. You know, other than the charity and the fundraising, can you hear this? As soon as I hit record on a camera, someone gets a power drill out. It was a good question. And it did make me think, I thought about it quite a lot. My response was, well, you know, I'm doing it for charity and it's a good event, but actually the reason why I do this is I love, I love walking. You know, I like running. I'm not very fast. When I first ran over a year and a half ago, it was the first time I'd done so probably since I was about 18 and I'm now 40 and it was horrific and I didn't get anywhere. And then slowly but surely over time, I ran a bit, walked a bit, ran a bit, walked a bit. I started enjoying running. When I came off the phone, I was thinking about it because it was an excellent question. And it was something that I was asking myself at 55 miles last night. There was no point turning up at a park run, hoping to run a sub 30 minute park run as I couldn't run to the end of my road. There was no point saying that I wanted to complete a marathon or win a Zwift race because I knew that I just couldn't do it. I had to focus on the only real barrier and that was my weight. Everything else was white noise. I also just want to quickly say I have started a podcast. It's called the Sit Rep Podcast. The first two episodes in season one are free to listen to and download off of my Patreon page. All you've got to do is sign an account up a free account 
and you can listen to the first two episodes. I go into more detail around this video. I talk a bit around my rationale behind some of the things I did. And in episode two, I answer all of the questions that I didn't answer in this video. So if you ask me a question and I never answered it today in this video, please listen to episode two as yeah, I'll answer it there for you. A good question I got in response to a YouTube community post was, did you have a defining wake up moment that led you to one day recognize that you were morbidly obese and needed to do something about it? What was the motivation behind it all? Now, I'll attempt to answer this throughout the course of this video as it's not an easy one to nail down, but it is a really, really good question. I also really appreciate you using the term morbidly obese. Thank you for that. I did mention the scales as an embarrassing wake up moment for me, but that was such a superficial issue that it doesn't really warrant being part of this answer. They then go on to say, you have what I'd consider quite an extreme mindset on exercise now, but that obviously wasn't always there. So I find it fascinating how you developed that seemingly overnight. Well, they're not wrong here. My new mindset, extreme or not, obviously wasn't there before. Otherwise I wouldn't have allowed myself to hit 190 kgs by the age of 39 and be morbidly obese. <laughs> That wasn't by accident, and it certainly didn't happen overnight. It was a lifetime of really, really poor choices. Two drinks, terrible. <laughs> it's a picture of someone that's very drunk. Look at that. There was a David Goggins short that I watched that resonated with me. I think it was titled Unbalanced or something along those lines. Once you become obsessed with something, obsessed, it's okay to be unbalanced for a while. You have to be unbalanced to find every bit of energy and strength that you have to pull it off. Then you get balanced once you become great. Now this video of his hit a nerve as this was my mindset without even realizing it. I was 100% unbalanced, I probably still am. I only realized it when I speak to other people in my life who have no interest in their own health or fitness past the point of just not getting a cold. They will get offended if I said this to them, so obviously I don't, but they have their own rationales and barriers they think they can't change. I'm referring to certain friends and family who are the first ones to call me extreme while simultaneously eating the same food I've given up in an extreme way, apparently. I'm talking about you know, having McDonald's and fish and chips and takeaways and kebabs on a regular basis. For the record, I'm not referring to serious health implications that affect anyone's ability to exercise. I'm talking about our mindset now in society. We've normalized a fast lifestyle and anyone breaking from that norm is considered unbalanced in their own mindset. When you walk down any high street in the UK and probably in the rest of the world, you will see that the majority of people you pass have no interest in their own fitness levels or what they eat, no thought to the consequence that their diet will have on their physical and mental well-being. Now I know that this is a triggering statement for some who watch this video, but I say it with confidence as this used to be me. I was literally the person I'm describing here and I still enjoy the occasional treat, but that's what it is, a treat. Even from my early teens, I had a really unhealthy relationship with exercise, food, I overate. And when I discovered beer earlier in my teens, oh my God, when I discovered beer, that was game over. Throughout my late teens, all of my 20s and 30s, I was the opposite of fit. I saw fitness, healthy eating, even mental well-being on the back of the benefits of fitness as mumbo jumbo, an area full of fake influencers and snake oil salesmen. Sport was for watching at the weekend with a beer and a burger. At the age of 18, I started at the bottom of the court corporate ladder, working my way up through the ranks and salary bandings, eventually peaking in a fairly well positioned, highly paid, but highly stressful central London based role. Yes, yeah, yeah. One thing I would like to mention is what am I covering off? <laughs> So not only was I ignorant to the possibilities and benefits that physical exercise could afford me, but even if I came around accidentally, I had no time to do anything. Any spare time I might have had was spent decompressing. Anyone that's in or had a stressful job will know what I mean by decompressing. Another word for drinking to switch off from the stresses of the day. The only reason I mention my career is that it had an enabling effect on my very poor life choices, and it's the best way I can answer Joe Hansen 7605's question about having a defining wake up moment that led to me doing something about it. As I moved up the career ladder, the financial benefits were great, but the lines between my job and my home life became more and more blurred. I only realized that now looking back on it. I had no idea at the time this is what was happening. Has it got the red button? Yeah, I think so. Oh, it's gone red. It says not minute. 
Now, another question I was asked on my post that I put on YouTube, do the wife and kids see you at half your weight and think you'll stop this journey and they'll have time with you back? Now, this is a really good question from Dan Riley 4403 and one I get asked a lot from those previously mentioned extended family and friends. They've stopped now and those questions slowed when they saw what I was doing was working. I've even got to the point that some of those around me have started copying my tactics with food and even the occasional exercise challenge. There was an assumption that it's possibly selfish to spend my spare time walking, running and cycling and then making videos about walking, running and cycling for YouTube. And in some ways it probably is, but I always make a point of trying to involve my family in my adventures. Recently, I took my youngest on one of my adventures over the Yorkshire Three Peaks. She loved it. This is harder than it looks. Are you okay though? Hey. Are you okay? I'm okay. Yeah. Thanks for asking. I'm not. You're not? <laughs> Are you okay? No. <laughs> Both of my children have been involved in my fitness journey from the very beginning. There was absolutely no way I could do what I do if it wasn't for the constant support of the most important three people in my life. Tracy is my biggest supporter and advocate. Every time I go to her with my latest challenge, she of course rolls her eyes, but always offers her support in the form of ideas and solutions to barriers I might face. Yeah, I heard it. So as you cross the line, he's got your names on a little iPad. I mentioned before a tip for anyone wanting to lose weight and or get fit. Another tip is to include those closest to you, the ones you love the most, include them and explain why you're trying to do what you're doing. Gain their buy-in as I promise that your early starts, your alarm calls, your long journeys to the start lines or requests for pickups will always need their patience and understanding. Having them invested in your personal journey will be the difference to success and failures and lots and lots of presents for these people. Treats and impromptu lunches at their favorite restaurants just to doubly ensure their support they know is appreciated. Never underestimate the power of a supportive and motivational partner, wife, husband, or even friend. It doesn't matter who they are. Yeah. Uh. Just someone who you love, who loves you and will support you no matter what. We're doing this. Because of my extremely demanding career, my alcohol consumption significantly increased from being social to being used daily as a way to switch off from the stresses of a demanding job, a way to decompress. The weekend only started when I had a beer or glass of wine in my hand. Then the weekend started to start on Thursday nights instead of Friday nights and lasted all the way through till Monday night. I don't mean that I went on a bender like a stag do from Thursday to Monday. I mean that when I got home from work, the weekend started on a Thursday instead of a Friday. Anyway, I will say in full transparency, I'm massively playing this darker aspect of my life down to keep this video light and airy. And then this of course had a knock on effect on my family. I wasn't present when I was home as I was always on the phone working. And when I wasn't, I was drinking to forget about work, zombieing out in front of the telly. Good work, Dad. Dads, you both dads. These are the regrets I have. I don't regret making any changes and going on this journey. I just want to quickly say, if anything I've said here resonates with you or you feel that this is something you're struggling with, then the biggest piece of advice I can give you is to reach out and ask for help. Talk to someone about it as a problem shared is a problem halved. I genuinely believe that. I never thought that at the time because I thought I knew best and I was embarrassed by it, but genuinely ask for help. I'm going to leave a link in the description for places that you can look at and read on about alcohol abuse or anything to do with what I've talked about today. I'm going to put in the description. So yeah, look, I'm not an expert. And the last thing I want to do is to upset anyone or make anyone feel that they're struggling and they don't know what to do about it. So I just thought I'd mention that really quickly. Can you see us, Mad? Yeah. Look, yeah. so I'm with Mad. So we've got a three mile walk and then we're going to... We're going to watch. What? I'm just filming. You're what? just filming your chin. <laughs> yeah. Just filming my chin. And then we're going to watch the lighting of the beacon. You're cold, man. Yeah. You're cold, Scarly? Not really. No. Oh, okay. I'll give it back then. <laughs> so, we've read three websites. One yeah. said it starts at 9.15. Are you in? <laughs> right. 
<laughs> too low. <laughs> you can't get us all lit. And the beacon. Get the beacon in. There we go. And it's one of them things that will only ever be lit for special occasions like today. I'll never regret the newfound freedom I now have thanks to the changes I have now made. The time I now have to be with my family. And when I am with my family, I'm present and engaging as I found a way to give up the booze and turn fully teetotal. It was the only way I could fix the problem. Ironically, even running or cycling pretty much every day and having events or challenges almost every weekend, I am now far more present and always involve my partner Tracy and my two teenage daughters in what it is that I'm doing. Much, unfortunately, to their dismay sometimes when that family time is a route march over the Yorkshire Free Peaks or a Saturday morning park run. <laughs> We're going to run as fast as we can from the green side. Always sprint for a finish line. Are you ready? Come on. Come on. But I know they love it. They just don't admit it for fear that their enthusiasm will be taken by me as it's an excuse to ask them to do more. <laughs> Scarly, come and get your tag. Otherwise you won't get your fit. Well done, Mad. Go and get your barcode. Get your, get the tag off the woman. You smashed it, come here. So proud of you. Well done. When I left my job, we set up our own business together, me and Tracy, and we involved our children. Running our own business not only means that we spend almost every waking moment together, but it also allows me to plan my time effectively between my fitness YouTube channel and what pays the bills and family time. Calorie restriction versus exercise for long-term weight loss and what's next. Well, the what's next part I'll answer shortly. In regards to calories versus exercise, I'm going to assume they're asking me what I think is best, a calorie deficit diet or exercising for weight loss. In short, the answer is both and neither equally, like Schrodinger's cat, where the cat is both dead and alive inside the box because you can't see it. I just thought I'd throw that in there because it sounds like I know what I'm talking about. Calorie deficit can work short term, but isn't a good thing long term. It's not a strategy long term as it ignores important things like nutritional value. Now I can eat 2,500 calories of Haribo or 2,500 calories of broccoli in a day. I mean, I'm not sure how much broccoli that would have to be. It'd have to be a lot to be 2,500. I mean, it's mostly water, isn't it, broccoli? But I could eat really bad, a lot of it, and it not do me any good whatsoever. It won't give me any of the nutritional value that I need to be able to run or cycle and probably stay off the toilet. I needed to change the root cause of why my diet wasn't right in the first place. Exercise alone isn't always good enough to get the weight off and keep it off. I learned early on in my journey that food and exercise go hand in glove. You can't have success in one without the other. To put it bluntly, there's no point going for a 300 calorie burning run to then eat a 400 calorie energy bar because they're just sweets in sheep's clothing. You're always much better off just having a decent, clean, home-cooked meal. We are now walking along eating bourbons <laughs> in, the, in the evening sun. Going back to my pre-2019 pressure cooker lifestyle, I ate to live, always on the go and always fast. Takeaways because I was home late, too late to cook, and retail park meal deals and Whoppers or Big Macs for lunch as it was convenient and quick and it didn't stop me working. Buying and eating clean was time consuming and I didn't have time oh well. for that nonsense. And rationalized a lot of my behavior and poor choices with opinions like I'm naturally big or I've got a slow metabolism. Literally anything to justify and defend my poor decisions. My obese size was due to self-inflicted systematic abuse and an ingrained learnt belief that it wasn't my fault. And then one other problem, fear of change. My favorite saying, which is relevant to the subject I'm talking about here, is change only happens when the fear of staying the same outweighs the fear of change. I've actually slightly changed that. That was a quote from someone called Tony Robbins. I'm not a huge fan of the presentation style of Tony Robbins. He's an author and a public speaker, sort of like a life coach person. He's a bit of a Marmite character. <laughs> Life. So I'm not saying don't expect anything because we can't do that as humans, but you gotta like to notice that expectations lead to suffering. But it's a really, really good quote, and it was something that came up on my feed at some point online. I think come up on Twitter, and I just it just blew me away. It's so true. But I think he says the risk of change rather than and I've changed it to the fear of change because for me, the word that was relevant was fear. That was relevant to me. Fear of change. 
My biggest problem was not only that I ate the wrong things, but my portion sizes as well. I could and would consume easily in excess of 5,000 calories a day, and this would ramp up to six or 7,000 at the weekend. Five to 7,000 calories sounds extreme, but if you actually measured and documented what you eat, it soon adds up. And then those calories start to build up and they have to be burnt off or they go somewhere. Sense checking and significantly reducing my daily calories meant I could control my portion sizes, and this was one of the biggest successes I've ever had. And then Honor Tech Mike asked, how do you keep motivated and not regress? Another question I got asked was one by Max Horrocks. And he asked me, how do you resist falling back into old habits? Do you have a routine that keeps you aiming in the right direction, like meditation or prayer? It's not meditation or prayer, even though I find myself in meditative states whilst out running or cycling. If I'm having a bad day or even a bad week, I'll go for a really long run. And that really helps me, helps me with my mental decompression. Running and exercise for me has replaced alcohol. I'm lucky that I find what I do to be really enjoyable and that plays a huge part. Don't get me wrong, there are days I don't want to run, Zwift or route march or cycle and on those days I have to force myself and sometimes I don't even bother forcing myself. If I'm having a really bad day, I just let that day slide. It's okay. Uh, I can pick myself back up and go again tomorrow. But I'm very lucky because overall, I love the feeling of overcoming a hard challenge and I love training for them. I love what I do. I love making videos about them and this really helps me. It's fun to chat to camera during these training sessions and on these big events. I find talking to camera like this quite therapeutic when it's about my journey and it's kind of like a journal of, of where I've been and where I'm going. <laughs> the bridge is wobbling. Oh, have a look at this. So this is what I'm dealing with. There's absolutely no way you can keep a pace up. Look. Now this question he's asked, or they both asked, is a simple answer. I keep moving forward. As long as I'm moving forward, no matter how small, I can't regress. Now the thing is, I'm not at my end goal just yet. And even though I've lost 95 kgs, I'm now the fittest, strongest, and fastest I've ever been in my life. That includes my teenage years. Unlike other runners, cyclists, Zwifters, YouTubers, I didn't have a peak in my 20s. I had no natural ability and I was beyond simply being unfit. I didn't just have a dad bod that I needed to lose and then I could, you know, smash out a two and a half hour marathon. To feel the way I feel now, I feel mentally like I've won lottery. I feel light, fast and strong, even when my marathon PR isn't the fastest or I'm still a catsy wannabe Zwifter. That doesn't matter to me. I won't mention being a cyclist as I still need stabilizers for this. I'm very much not a competent cyclist. You will see that from next week's video. Shit. Oh when I upload my London to Brighton attempt. Now this probably isn't the answer these two commenters wanted when they asked their question. There isn't a secret to success that influencers or weight loss companies would have you believe exists. My answer probably won't help you find your motivation unless you've been on the same journey I have because this comes back to my first point which is don't copy or emulate you need to find your own reason as the lost boy said to robin williams's peter pan in the movie hook you need to find your happy place otherwise you can't fly thoughts not being in a slingshot would make me very happy i really need to watch that movie again it's a really really good movie uh, I've got two kids that are teenagers that probably won't want to watch it, so I might make them watch it. It was a really good 80s, or was it 80s or 90s? Uh, and then I might have a, a Goonies Fest after that as well. But yeah, Hook, really good movie. You need to find your reason for why you're doing this. This is why copying or even emulating others on social media will never work long term unless they've been through what you've been through. Having a target to lose weight or get fit isn't a target, it's a means to an end. It's the fitness equivalent of a car mechanic wanting to fix cars because he wants to use his new spanners. Your motivation to lose weight can't be to lose weight. Your motivation to get fit can't simply be to get fit. I'm telling you now that if it is, when the going gets tough, and it will, when the pain and uncomfortable suffering kicks in, and it will, then your reason for why you're out there suffering won't be enough. Your reason for running because you want to run further won't be enough. You can't have an emotional reaction to a pack of spanners. I've made that analogy a lot harder than it needed to be, talking about spanners. Oh my god. This is bullshit.
You simply won't have enough of a motivator to override the urges, cravings, or negative feelings that inevitably creep in when you hit barriers involved with change. Seemed not a good idea four months ago. There will always be significant resistance and friction involved with serious change. To overcome that, you need to have something slightly more motivating than losing a few pounds for your holiday. Unless you want to lose a few pounds for your holiday, in which case that's perfectly acceptable and you probably didn't need to sit through the entirety of this video to realise that. Not everyone needs to be able to run a marathon in under four hours or a park run in under 30 minutes. Sometimes exercise, just for the sake of exercising, is perfectly acceptable because it makes you feel good. That's why I do it sometimes. When you're hungry because you've attempted to reduce your calorie intake, when you're tired because you've run or cycled a long way and you think about why you're putting yourself through this pain and endurance and suffering and you remember it's simply just to be fit or lose weight then that won't be enough in that moment and you'll stop because you're tired you'll pick up that donut or big mac and eat it because f it at least you tried that high street is full of tryers it's not my fault i'm not built for running i'm a big bloke and 2500 calories isn't enough for a hard-working six foot two guy like me i need more food that monologue was literally everything i said to myself when i started on this journey your happy place isn't worth sh and you fall from the sky like a lawyer with face paint on his belly. It's coming down! I need to watch Hook again. It's a really, really good movie and writing this script has made me want to watch it. <laughs> it sounds extreme, but I've been there. Trust me, you need real motivation and that's 100% individual and specific to each and every one of you watching this video. Find your happy place. This sounds like a really good way to end the video, but I haven't ended the video here because I've got another question from Honor Mike Tech. He asks, what's your secret to success when so many others have failed? I've said it before, there is no secret sauce, no magical spell or special pill. I don't know anyone that's failed. If you try, you're doing something which is better than nothing. Most people I meet don't like change. I was no different, but suddenly at the end of 2018, the scales moved and the fear of staying the same suddenly outweighed the fear of that innate change. I did not want to stay the same or at least the same as I was for the majority of my adult life. It's why organisations like Weight Watchers are so popular and make a fortune as a business. It's why we have Go Sober for October or Veganuary in the UK. I don't know if there are such things in, in the US for that. Companies taking advantage of people's needs and wants to change but offering a comfortable, controlled, dumbed down and sanitised version of that change. Just enough to dip your toe in and say you've tried but not so extreme enough that you panic and run for the hills. How can others implement what you've learned and accomplished? Believe you can do it. Know it will happen. Be kind to yourself, especially when the wheels fall off. And most importantly, keep moving forward, no matter how small those steps are. When you're running a 100k ultra marathon, you reach a point where the only thing you can focus on is just putting one foot in front of the other. Remember, this journey you're on isn't a sprint. It's an ultra marathon. Just put one foot in front of the other. Whatever happens, just keep putting one foot in front of the other. One foot in front of the other. <laughs> I woke up one day at the end of 2018 and decided enough was enough. Tracy told me relentlessly that I wasn't okay. I quit alcohol. That had to be the first thing to go. I couldn't do anything as long as that existed. I had to fix the problem and I couldn't do that if I was still drinking. I gave up all fried and processed food and obsessively counted my calories of everything I ate. Not because I wanted to eat low calories, but because I wanted to educate myself about what it was I was eating. I saw fruit and vegetables as free calories, meaning I didn't count these and I could eat as much of it as I wanted. But doing this helped with my biggest problem, portion control. That was my biggest problem. I stopped all takeaways, fast food, fried food, sugar, sweets. I stopped snacking in between meals. This was really hard. I was constantly hungry as I was now only eating 2,000 to 2,500 calories, which was pretty much half of what I was used to eating. With the help of my partner Tracy, as I'm unfortunately a terrible cook, and this had to be done as a family. This was a family thing. I, I couldn't be on this diet and have everyone else around me eating bacon rolls and filling their faces with crisps. So with the help of my family, I focused on healthy portion control meals three times a day, and that's it, clean eating.
Then, not long after this change, I also turned fully vegan, partly due to my eldest daughter who wanted to stop eating animal products for animal welfare reasons, and I wanted to support her, but also I was interested to see if this fairly radical change would help me in my new weight loss and fitness ambitions. For anyone that knew me, quitting alcohol and becoming vegan was a complete role reversal. It was like expecting water to stop being wet or asking a goldfish to climb a tree, completely against the grain. Interestingly, going from being a huge carnivorous meat eater to being a flapjack loving long haired bearded tree hugging vegan it was one of the best things I did from a weight loss and fitness perspective not for the obvious reasons as well I'm going to make a separate video about being vegan as it's a spicy meatball, excuse the pun, and I don't want the comment section on this attempt at a positive video being hijacked by those that think I'm about to keel over with brittle bone syndrome. Trust me, I've been vegan now for five years and yeah, I'm the healthiest I've ever been. Trust me when I say you really don't need to comment on this aspect of the video, just yeah, move on. I will, however, quickly say on this point that being a complete vegan novice meant I had to learn what was in my favourite food types, as this level of scrutiny educated me about what I was putting in my body, the effects it had on me, and how best to fuel my ever-demanding fitness expectations that I had. Sometimes we eat, me included, what we're told to by marketing firms and mega brands without actually knowing what's in the things that we're eating. In a nutshell, turning vegan made me an amateur, entry-level nutritionist wannabe, enough so that I knew what I was doing was good and it would allow me to run a long way but not so much of a know-it-all that I felt the need to film myself in an Asda reading the back of cereal packets and then posting that on Instagram demanding people only eat red meat and broccoli. This ain't food. If you enjoy your crunchy nut cornflakes in the morning, then eat your crunchy nut cornflakes in the morning. Just maybe cut out the takeaways and McDonald's drive through on the way home. I took this obsessive approach to vegan food and applied it to all my weight loss and fitness. I knew nothing about losing weight other than that I need to stop eating crap and eat less of what I did eat. And I knew even less about my fitness journey other than that to join a gym was probably a good thing and avoid spinning classes at all costs. Have you guys seen a spinning class? They're crazy. So I did what any normal, hugely obese bloke would do in his late 30s, early 40s. I signed up for a 100k ultramarathon event, knowing full well that I couldn't and probably wouldn't finish it. In a couple of months, I'm going to be taking on Race to the Stones 2024. That was the first ever event, the one that I just mentioned there. That was the first ever event I signed up to when I couldn't run. I could barely walk and I signed up to this event, giving myself just enough time to train for it. I started walking and I didn't stop. That was the beginning of my journey. I'm really looking forward to making that video, my return to Race to the Stones. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I really appreciate you taking the time to watch to this point. If you enjoyed what I said, please consider giving me a like and subscribe as that really helps my channel. Please leave me your experiences in the comment. Please don't worry about leaving me anything about being vegan or anything like that. I don't need advice around that because, yeah, it's all part of the journey. It's all part of the fun of life and we're all on that journey together. Please share with me your experiences and I hope to see you in the next video it's going to be a good one london to brighton baby london to brighton you can fly you can fight and you can fight. Fight.